wonderful presentation. Um, our next uh, presenter comes from Canada. Um, uh, Hugo Lafreniere uh, is finishing his uh, studies at uh, McGill University. He was a student fellow at uh, Paul André uh, Grepo Center for Private and Comparative Law, and uh, he is now doing research at the Center for Intellectual Property Policy. And his research interests are at the crossroads of uh, legal pluralism and uh, virtue ethics. And uh, Hugo is going to talk to us about uh, uh, genealogy of radical pluralism. So, thank you very much. I believe my presentation is a little bit under 20 minutes. So, if you have any question or you ask want me to uh, repeat something during the presentation, please uh, feel comfortable to do so. Um, I have uh, some uh, visual aids there that I will use uh, from time to time. Um, in this presentation, uh, I will try to shed a new light on radical pluralism by plunging into its history. Uh, radical pluralism is a particular form of legal pluralism that has been developed out of postmodern legal thinking. Um, the literature about this theory is small, but offers original and heuristic alternative to some major defects of uh, positivist jurisprudence. Among other things, it offers a new answer to the age-old question of how to determine whether a social norm has legal validity or not. At first sight, pluralism to, uh, radical pluralism's theory of legal validity seems to be something like this. Social norms obtain legal validity in so far as they are considered as legal by a legal subject. This is the superficial definition that will be later opposed to a more complex historical definition. To most legal scholars, this superficial proposition should be quite disturbing. How could law, the symbol of social objectivity, be determined by the will of a single individual? Is it really possible that some people think that the fact I believe something to be a law is, suffi is sufficient to transform this thing into a law? In any cases, this is what the literature on radical pluralism seems to suggest. Roderick MacDonald, one of the leading scholars on the subject, goes as far as to write that any act or uterines that code social acts according to the binary code of lawful, unlawful, may be regarded as part of the legal system, no matter where it was made and no matter who made it. This offers useful insight about how legal subjects participate to the creation of social and legal norms. However, it seems hardly capable of replacing the positivist theory of legal validity. The question then becomes, is radical pluralism incomplete? Is it incapable of producing, as it proposed to do, a concept of legal validity that would be appealing to the legal, practical mind. I suggest that the answer to this question is no. Radical pluralism is a complete jurisprudential proposition, and it does propose a practical concept of legal validity. I believe that the reason why radical pluralism is thought to be incomplete and overly subjectivist is that it is not considered in its historical context. If the concept it uses were to be understood in their historical sense, I believe radical pluralism would, would be much more widely accepted. For this reason, I propose to trace back the theoretical history of radical pluralism in order to better understand its problematic dimension. In my opinion, the problem of radical pluralism lies in the use it makes of the concept of individual agency as the source of legal validity. It is because it trusts the indi individual agent with a law-creating power that radical pluralism is seen as too subjectivist to produce a useful criterion of legal validity. My historical study will thus be aimed at better understanding how the concept of individual agency as the source of legal validity was understood in radical pluralism's historical roots. My proposition is that through its historical development, radical pluralism came to consider that the agency required to produce legal validity is equivalent to practical wisdom. That is, the virtuous internalization application of a given social uh, virtue. And this is the more historical complex uh, definition that I will try to uh, support by my historical analysis. In that sense, radical pluralism's true theory of legal validity should rather be spelled out like this. Social norms are legal insofar as they participate to the creation of social virtue. From my point of view, that is what true radical pluralism should look like. But more on that later. For, some, for now, some remarks on my historical methodology are required. First of all, I believe that, the one, that one of the only ways to, to, uh, to understand a complex social construct is through uh, historical analysis. As Shal Taylor explained in Sources of the Self, any identity is historical in nature. 
an identity, be it conceptual or cultural, is a telos and not a fixed moment in time that can be described statically. This is why in order to complete our understanding of radical pluralism, I will plunge into its history. However, I do not want to retrace the universal history of radical pluralism. This project would be way too ambitious and to a certain extent unproductive. Historical an analysis is only possible by focusing on a specific environment. The share of the information that is forming a tradition and the identity of a community can only exist within an environment that is somehow continuous. In that sense, the mere existence of a similar idea in different places is not a guarantee of a same theoretical identity. This is why instead of analyzing the whole of the historical history of radical pluralism, I propose to study the roots it has in my home institution of McGill University in Canada. For more than 170 years, McGill has been the center for the uh, center for the development of legal pluralism and still today works on the deepening of, of its key concepts. Even though the theoretical history of McGill University is not perfectly similar to the one of other sites of reflection on pluralism, I believe that it is still relevant to anybody interested in law and pluralism. This theoretical history of McGill is composed of four periods that, are each, that each have their own theoretical particularities. These are the four periods that are listed there. Each of them uses the concept of agency as the source of legal validity in a similar way that orients how we should understand radical pluralism in the Megillian context. The first period is generally associated with historical jurisprudence, the second one with soci sociology and legal realism, the third one with neo-naturalism and Fullerian jurisprudence, and the fourth one with the theories of tradition of Patrick Glenn. I will now in turn, analyze these four periods in order to see uh, what use they make of the concept of agency as the source of legal validity. So, the first period of McGill's theoretical history ranges from 1843, the foundation of the faculty, to 1914, and is marked by a particular form of historical jurisprudence. This jurisprudence is generally similar uh, to the thinking of the French jurist Eugène Lerminier, who himself inspired himself with the historical work of uh, uh, von Savigny uh, in Germany. Uh, the jurisprudence of Lermigny was both taught in classes and revendicated in Megil by Megillian scholars. At that time, at that time, Megillian scholars thought that the law was obtained by adapting universal reasons to the practical necessities of a society. Take the example of property. Universal reason proposes that individuals have an absolute right to the product of their work. To, ge uh, to generate legality, one has to take such proposition and to create, on its basis, a concrete and socially limited institution. In the case of the ideal of property, the corresponding institution would thus be the right of ownership. From that point of view, the defining char characteristic of, legal, of a legal system is that the norms it contains are an adaptation of, of universal reason to one's contingent social reality. Um, universal reason without adaptation is metaphysical raving, and practical reason without universal reason is uh, blind intuitionism. What makes a norm legally valid for historical jurisprudence is the process of adaptation that lies in between. However, Megill historical jurisprudence never produced any conceptual guidelines on how to adapt universal reason. According to the scholars of that period, the only way to adapt universal reason was through an exercise of practical wisdom that is, through experience, learning, and open reflection. Within this framework, practical wisdom is thus considered as the defining criteria of legal validity. For historical jurisprudence, there are no substantive criteria to determine whether a norm has legal validity or not. The only evaluative criterion is whether the norm in question has been produced to the right exercise of agency, that is, in this case, through practical wisdom. This is how the concept of agency as the source of legal validity was understood in McGill during the second half of the 19th century. To suggest that, in order to create a legal validity, agency as to express itself through practical wisdom is a major shift from what first seemed to be the proposition of radical pluralism, the superficial definition, very subjectivist, that we discussed earlier. We will see that the new orientation of the concept of agency as the source of legal validity as that has been defended by Megill's scholar is confirmed in other periods of Megill's theoretical history. We now pass to the second period of social realism. The next period of this history goes from 1914 to 1946 
and is marked by a particular form of social realism. The theoretical work of McGill scholar from that time can easily be associated with the constructive side of Carl's Llewellyn legal realism, and it, it is most observable in the work of jurists like Robert Lee, Herbert Smith, Ira Mackey, Percy Corbett, and Francis Scott. These are uh, supposed to ring a bell for you because they are uh, not for you, but at least for me because they are very famous scholars in uh, Canadian uh, scholarship. Um, that distrust of these Megillian realists for uh, traditional formal rules comes from the fact that such rules are not well equipped enough to have a predictable effect on the complex network of norms that affect courts. Formalism is incapable of taking into account many of the informal elements that affect judicial decision maker, such as cultural bias or hidden political interests. When a rule does not communicate a holistic impression of what it commands, the individuals who are supposed to obey it are not accountable anymore for the portion of their action to which the rule fails to apply. Without any clear instruction about what a rule commands to do, the social context in which judicial agents will thus no, I'm sorry, the social context in which judicial agents act will thus fail to make legal decision makers accountable for their decision. By failing to apply to more subtle aspects of a decision process, a formal rule will create a non-legal discretion within which the agent will be free to act as she pleases, unaffected by legal imperatives. This is why McGill realists proposed a form of legal norms which could have an effect on the whole of the agent's decision-making process. In that sense, such norms should have a strong aesthetic dimension because it must strike the agent with a, all, uh, with a single all-encompassing feeling of necessity. The state of internal coherence created by this aesthetic es effect is what characterized legal norm during the social realist period of McGill history. The logical consequences of this jurisprudence are that norms will only be seen as fully legal if, it, if they are able to create this state of coherence. In return, to reach such a state, the individual must have completely internalized the value contained in the legal norm. Otherwise, there will still be non-judicial discretionary considerations that will influence the individual decision making. We can see that during the first half of the 20th century, the second period in the list, Megillion scholars continued to use the concept of agency as the source of legal validity, as meaning that legality is produced when a legal subject internalizes value. This process of internalization, internalization, as we should remember, is synonymous with practical wisdom in the Aristotelian tradition. In some, during this period, Megillion scholars thought that practical wisdom was the act of agency required to create legal validity. Following the social realist period, we now pass to the third period of Megill's history, composed and dominated by a specific form of neo-naturalism. This period lasted until 1978, and its principal figures were Maxwell Cohen, Louis Baudouin, and international uh, jurist uh, Edward McWhiney. As we will see, these jurists all adopt a jurisprudence similar to Kristen Condell's interpretation of Lund's Fuller jurisprudence. According to this interpretation, the objectives of Fuller's jurisprudence was to formulate a general criterion that could be used to differentiate a legal system from any other normative systems. The criterion was that a legal system, as opposed, let's say, to a normative system between a slave and his master, um, that, that the legal system respects the agency of the normative subject. In that sense, legality would never impose a norm that would not give the chance to the legal subjects to process it in a free decision-making process. The, eight, the, the famous eight rules of failure for any legal system that Fuller identifies are as many examples of how a legal system can go astray by failing to respect this condition. For example, Fuller condemns retroactivity because it creates a norm to which the legal subject could not possibly obey. By doing so, it fails to offer the legal subject with the possibility of exercising, exercising agency and arms the legal system as a whole. In the words of Fuller, legislation does not tell a man what he should do to accomplish specific ends set by the lawgiver, but rather furnishes him with the baseline against which to organize life with his fellows. Megill scholar of that time took upon this basic proposition and deduced that the only way law could lead to social virtue was by encouraging legal subjects to internalize social values. When a law refuses to prescribe fixed behavioral objective, then social order can be reached if legal subjects internalize laws underlying ideals. 
In turn, the possibility of internalization is lost defining characteristic. The final point of this form of neo-naturalism being that no set of social ideals should be seen as legal in nature without being actually or possibly internalized by, by uh, legal subjects. During the neo-naturalist period of McGill's theoretical history, the concept of agency as the source of legal validity was thus still associated with virtue and the general process of value internalization. This comes as close as possible from what I perceive to be the historically current conception of what agency represents for uh, radical pluralism. With, this end of the, uh, with the end of this last period of accident, uh, neo-naturalism, uh, comes the end uh, of neo-natural uh, The theoretical history of McGill enters in its last pre-radical pluralism period. It is a period that has been mainly marked by the theory of legal traditions of Patrick Glenn, which is a well-known uh, McGillian scholar. Even though, this, even though this theory is specific to McGill, uh, it is somehow parallel to the jurisprudence of Ronald Dworkin and has been generally endorsed by William Twining. To sum it up, Glenn's theory of tradition proposes that legal systems should be replaced by legal traditions. The difference is that legal traditions are not defined by institution or official behaviors. Rather, they form an informational corpus shared by the member of a community. A tradition exists as long as the same body of information is continuously transmitted among a specific group of individuals. In order to make a legal statement, one has to refer to a tradition. With, uh, which, is, which form the common background of all involved party and is thus contextually persuasive. In that sense, Glenn saw the corpus from which legal elements can be drawn as being as fluctuant as is the tradition that unites a community and makes it sensible to the same normative elements. Within this conception, legal arguments are not binding, they are persuasive. The individual legal subject has to be able to recognize which normative element will be persuasive and in which context. Again, this is an exercise of free practical thinking within which the individual, individual must exercise our agency in a complex fashion. The question of, all internaliza of, uh, the question of internalization is left untouched by Glenn's theory. But it seems dubious that the agent could survive in our tradition without internalizing the value it bears. Belonging to a legal tradition is way too complex to be faked. It is then possible to say that Glenn's theory of legal traditions also saw the concept of agency as the source of legal validity, as meaning that legality is created through practical wisdom, that is, the practical moral action of an agent who has completely internalized a social value. Following that last period, um, uh, marked by the work of uh, Patrick Glenn, McGill University will come its latest generation of legal thinker, uh, thinkers who directly uh, participated in the creation of the literature on radical pluralism. Therefore, having now reached the modernity of McGill's theoretical history, it is possible to ask again, what is radical pluralism? Our first superficial answer to this question was, radical pluralism is a theory according which a social norm obtained legal validity whenever an agent sees it as legal. However, we have seen that this answer is incomplete and does not consider the historical meaning of the concept of agency as a source of legal validity. The aim of my genealogy was to restore the true historical meaning of this concept. Through its history, theoretical thinking and McGill considered that in order to produce legality, an exercise of agency had to be so complex as to amount to the internalization of virtue. In this context, radical pluralism understood from an historically, historical perspective should be reconceptualized as a theory according which normative elements are legal insofar as they participate to the creation of virtue. I believe this new definition of radical pluralism offers a much more useful basis for determining the legal validity of social norms. Among other things, it requires an objectively complex act of agency that will, most of the time, need to be sustained by a strong social context in order to arise. This conclusion seems to me to be enough to reopen radical pluralism research agenda in a more constructive way. To a certain extent, this reopening is already under its way in McGill University, but it still needs a more rigorous theoretical framework. This paper and this presentation were uh, an attempt to participate to the reconstruction of such a uh, theoretical framework. Um, I now uh, thank you for your attention and I will be uh, glad to answer questions at the end if you have any.